Hey everyone, this is Cam Garrity. Welcome back to This Should Have Been a Phone Call. Today on the show, we have Joe Matthew, whose work as an illustrator is known all around the world. Since 1971, he has been working with Sesame Street, doing illustrations for the show's toys, apparel, and most importantly, its robust library of storybooks. In my opinion, it's impossible to discuss the visual legacy of Sesame without including Joe's iconic work. What makes his art so singular is his ability to capture the Muppet's movement and energy in every line and brushstroke. His renderings are truly an authentic representation of the characters, not necessarily because they were an exact depiction of how they look on TV, but because of how he translates their essence into two dimensions. I have loved Joe's work since literally before I could even read. For me, growing up, Sesame Street wasn't just about the show that played on PBS. It was the books and toys and cassette tapes and VHS sleeves and placemats. Those Muppet characters were burned into my imagination, and his illustrations definitely helped to fan the flames. He was one of the people who, as a kid, inspired me to want to be a professional artist, and he continues to influence me every time I pick up a pencil. Our conversation here really was just such a dream come true. This should have been a phone call with my favorite illustrator, Joe Matthew. So are you, you're still working with, with Sesame and, and doing books, correct? Yes, I, I still am. I think I'm, I'm just winding up my 172nd book or something like that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I like to count them as complete books that, that I've illustrated. If I collaborate with someone else, I, I don't count that. So there, there'll be another 60 or 70 books if I count the collaborations. Yeah, th- that's what I've been up to for the last fifty years or so. That's incredible. I, I've been self-employed that entire time. I've actually never had a job. <laughs> I've never had employment, which is something I think to be proud of. I'll say, yeah, that's that's every artist's dream, right? Yes. So when I finally was offered a job, I turned it down. I, I suspect if I had taken that, it was a, an amazing job too. Uh, I got a job to work with the Muppets at about the time the Muppet Show started, and I couldn't believe I couldn't hear it, believe hearing it come out of my own mouth, but I said no, thank you. Wow, what was the job you were offered? Well, it was employment as a, basically an art director, I assume at okay. uh, at the Muppets. Similar to like what Michael Frith would have been doing. Over yes, there. it was Michael that actually offered me the job. Okay, and what was it at the time that made you say no, no, thank you to that? Because I'm sure. At other points in your career, or you know, certainly other people would hear themselves get offered a job at the Muppets and absolutely immediately say yes to that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I hadn't been doing this for all that long. The idea of a job, you know, I would have loved any kind of employment. You know, it's not easy getting a freelance career going from scratch. But by then I had some momentum and I rather liked having my names on the book and having the control of the creative process. For one thing, at least as an illustrator, and just control over my life, basically. And I was able to work uh, for royalties on a lot of projects, which, you know, people don't like to talk about money. And they certainly didn't like to talk about it when I was in art school. It didn't exist. (laughs) No, they leave that part out. (laughs) They they really do. And I really wonder what they do today. I, I would love to know what they do in art school these days. But there was no no mention of that. And I learned very quickly that a royalty was a good thing. I think publishers back, see, this goes back and forth. They, for a while, sometimes they want you to take a royalty and sometimes they won't. And obviously it's for their benefit. Yeah, they're, they're hoping for anything that they could pay you less. <laughs> right. And they, they figure, well, uh, an agent once told me that uh, certain publishers, I shouldn't name any names, take a family of four and put them in a room for a year and see how little they can feed them. <laughs> <laughs> and still keep them alive. That's what they base the royalty rates on. But I suspect that's just a joke. Yeah. 
That's where they got the name Random House, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking of Random House. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But a lot of them wanted to give you a royalty because they figured you were going to screw it up and the book would never go anywhere anyway, and they would come out ahead. Yeah. But I did some books that were taking off, thanks to my great genius, of course, and the fact that they happened to be Muppets in them, and Sesame Street was an amazing show, and we were doing the first of the Sesame, pretty much the first of the Sesame Street books. And I really wanted to, if at all possible, get a royalty. Well, the publishers were delighted. So I got royalties for everything for a long time. And they don't all take off, but all it takes is a few of them. And, you're, and you've got a pretty solid base for your, for your income every year, basically, oh, yeah. because you, you're going to make some money whether you get any work or not, you know, as you build up the royalties. But they don't teach this sort of thing in art school, as I said. And I was starting to appreciate that. And I thought, well... I rather like the way this is going for the moment. And, you know, there was a thing they used to, back in the 70s or something, it was called the Peter Principle. I'm not familiar with that. That had to do with people who get jobs and get promotions because they do a good job, they're promoted. Well, they're eventually promoted to something they absolutely have no capacity to handle at all. So you eventually promote yourself, get yourself promoted into complete uh, incompetence. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do here. Just because I can illustrate a book, draw a cute picture, doesn't mean that I can be an art director because it's a completely different skill set. Yeah. And I thought, I, I think I'd rather remain a, an illustrator. I liked, at that point, I became an illustrator who had chosen to be a freelance illustrator as opposed to one who was forced into that. And I rather liked that too. Oh, for sure. Well, and I, I think too about, first of all, I, I love that Peter principle. I, I've not heard of that. I'm, I'm sure along the way, I've probably worked for people who <laughs> have been promoted into into incompetence, as you said. That's really funny. No, and I, I imagine some of those books that really took off are probably still in print today. <laughs> and certainly That's not cool. every not every franchise is Sesame Street, but... Right, right. Well, I, I enjoyed working with Sesame Street so much. I, mean, I, was, I was born a Muppet fan. And when I was a kid, the Muppets would be the guests on different shows you know, the evening shows and the morning shows yeah. and parents always would call me, let me miss the bus or whatever, just to see the, the Muppets. And to be working with them was always amazing. And I loved Sesame Street as well. I liked what they had to say. I liked being part of that. And I never got the same thrill out of working with other, I never felt comfortable really working for other characters, uh, licensed characters. So I, I felt that I had found my, my spot basically. So I, I stayed with that. Joe, at, at this point, I love asking people just a couple random questions. It kind of opens up the mind pores a little bit and can often lead to, to some fun areas. I wonder, is there a fictional character that you empathize with the most a fictional character that i hmm i thought you were going to ask me about the first time i ever lied oh well <laughs> we could do that one too <laughs> yeah i don't want to have to get into that fictional character for, for some reason i want to say lieutenant colombo okay yeah and i don't know why i just i just like the way he he took on the, the arrogant people who were bigger and powerful and uh, whenever I put on a raincoat, I suddenly started talking like <laughs> Lieutenant Colombo and asking people if I could ask one more thing. That's so great. I wonder, you know, that that element of being able to talk to people above your station, did you feel that kind of speaking truth to power as you do political cartoons? Um, that may be a wild leap, and I don't mean to... <laughs> <laughs> if that's not the case, I don't feel pressure to, to agree with that or not. I, I think I always felt a little bit, I was impressed by a lot of people that I met in New York. And I, I always felt like this ragtag hick coming into everyone's offices, basically. When I, when I f was first showing my, my work around New York City, I would go in with my literally my last dollar. And um, I, would, I would go into these unbelievably beautiful offices and meet these art directors who I just thought, now these people have jobs. You know, these, 
these are beautiful offices and everything. And I remember this one guy at one of the major publishers, I felt like Lieutenant Colombo walking into his office one day. And he was a big, tall guy with a, you know, a handmade suit and gorgeous furniture. And it was a penthouse. And um, I showed him my work, which he looked at with a certain amount of impatience. And when I f finished with the show, he said, well, who the hell do you think you are? And uh, I thought, well, <laughs> geez, I didn't expect to be asked that. And, uh, you know, he said, well, you know, you're coming because you want to get work. Do you realize that in this Rolodex right here, I have the names and phone numbers of every illustrator in New York, including so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and Jack Davis. <laughs> no pressure. Right. And I said, well, oh, geez, you know, I, uh, he said, I can get any, what makes you think that I'm going to call you? And when I think back, he was absolutely right. I must have been crazy. I, I, when I think of this, some people don't want to have jobs or they want to do a certain thing in life. They go into the creative arts. They, they make a decision to go to art school. You know, you're committing yourself and you, you, your life is going to go in a whole different direction because you did this. This is no joke. And you end up in a guy's office with a handmade suit and a penthouse view and everything. And he's asking you what the hell you're thinking of. And he's probably asking that for a good reason. Because, I, frankly, I didn't feel that I was that good, you know. Anyway, I thanked him for taking the time to see me. And I gave that some thought. But I didn't give up. And I eventually got things going. Yeah, that's kind of the little scruffy character that I felt like, I think, when I walked into these offices. No, and thank goodness you continued that confidence and being able to to build yourself up in a way that you, I, I'm sure an experience like that probably would have made people with, with lesser determination just be like, ah, maybe I, I should have been a teacher or, <laughs> or something well, that's else. Right. But, you know, nothing, nothing in the world of illustration, freelance illustration scared me nearly as much as the the idea of having a boring job yeah <laughs> and boring friends and a boring house i mean the, the whole thing was just dreadful i want to do anything i can take any amount of <laughs> i can face the the biggest dragon fire breathing dragon the guy in the handmade suit or anything you know that's right and i suspect uh that's what most people th think who go into the arts it's an it's an amazing thing when you Look at all the people in art school and how wonderful they are, really, just just by the fact of who they are. Yeah. No, you meet incredible, incredible people. Yeah. Lifelong friends. Another random question. And this is a new one. I came up with this one today. So it's <laughs> it's not about a lie. What's what's the best money that you ever spent on something that you didn't need? My goodness. Um, <laughs> I, I keep thinking of a good bottle of wine. But oh, maybe, that's good. Maybe I maybe I needed it, but I, I do think that's <laughs> well. Yeah, a really good bicycle. Oh, I like that. But I kind of needed that too, I think. But I, that that became a passion as as I got busier and busier as an illustrator. I, I basically wasted my twenties on overwork in in a sense. But it did lay the groundwork. I did some of my best work and all that. But I was working all night. Frankly, I couldn't believe my good luck my good fortune to be able to do this for a living. I thought, I have fooled everybody. I'm a complete fraud. This is amazing. And so I, I didn't dare turn anything down because it all it might all vanish. I'll say, well, right. I just turn work so, Someone might figure it out. Like, oh. They're, they're going to see right through me if I say I'm, I can't do this. So I, I got to be about 30 years old. And I, I had started my career at about 22 years old. So I've been working for a while by the time I got to be 30. And I was a physical wreck. I stayed up all night working very, very often. Got some good stories about trying to drive to New York after two nights of being awake oh, or falling asleep on the train and waking up in Penn Station with my head against some man's shoulder, sound asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, what caught my attention, but I, I saw a, a, a real nice bicycle. On it. And I asked, well, you know, how far do you go on, on a on a bike ride. How far can how far can someone go? And the person said, Well, hundred miles. I, I think they just picked that out of a 
hat. Yeah, they I don't just think they really know what they were saying. But I took that literally, and I thought, that is the most wonderful thing I've ever heard of, to go for 100 miles under my own steam. And so I got really some nice bikes over the years, and, and I became a very avid cyclist. And I would go for 100-mile bike rides. I did many, many 100-mile bike rides, 100-and-something 100-mile bike rides. And whenever I had to figure something out or if I had finished a big project or whatever, I would get on my bike for the day, just take off. And I wouldn't come home until I did 100 miles. That's incredible. I, I you know, I got into the more expensive bikes, and I, I guess that was a that was considered a splurge, but I considered it something that was really good for me. It was a, a positive addiction, if she will mind yeah. me saying that. Yeah, and I, I am, would imagine, you know, I, I have similar kind of experiences both on on bicycles as well as I, I love kayaking, but that experience of just being in almost like a meditative state as it's you're... Absolutely. That's yeah. exactly what it is. I, I only did uh, kayaking once, and I thought that was the next big thing for me mm -hmm. because it is so similar to cycling. Yeah. It really is. It's a matter of efficiency and balance and... All that sort of thing. Yes, I, I would have loved kayaking. Mm -hmm. Do you have a memorable, memorable story behind getting a scar? <laughs> Gee, not really. I, I can only think of one. It, it was a winter. It was, I don't know, 10 or so years ago. And it was a winter and I tripped on some ice. I slipped on some ice and I fell right on my noggin. And I, I oh, cut gosh. my forehead. My mother asked me if I cut myself shaving. She had a sense of humor. But as it healed, I thought, I looked just like Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like that. And there's some picture of me, whenever my a picture of me shows up on the internet, this might be one of them. And and uh, I have this L-shaped uh, gash on my forehead. Oh my it's goodness. out there on the web somewhere if you look around. Oh, I'll have to go digging for it. <laughs> <laughs> I think myself and, and so many other people responded to in your illustration is really the way you brought the characters to life on the page. It wasn't so much that you were just drawing the the still puppet, because mm -hmm. if you draw a puppet that's not in motion or you take a photo of it, unless you're a Richard Termini, they often can kind of look very basically dead. Uh, you know, yeah. they, they just don't have that that light to them. Absolutely. Where you seem to be able to really create lines of motion and, and movement. They, they felt so alive on that page. It wasn't a one-to-one -one representation of them. How long did it take you to sort of figure that out and to perfect it? And um, I guess, were you even conscious that you were doing that necessarily or just trying to be true to the characters? Well, I, I noticed that my my characters moved. And, and I, I always felt that as, as well as some people drew them, they looked very frozen and still. Yeah. And I always thought that movement was a big part of the way the Muppets look, but it's also the way I like to illustrate a book. I like the movement to go from one page to the next. You should be drawn to turn the page. And when my children were little, I used to love for them to look at the drawings. And basically, I wanted them to see the progression. Tell me what's happening. Yeah. You, know, you went from here to here to here. How did we get there? And if they get stuck... Or you, you don't want to reverse it, reverse motion. You want to keep it going from left to right. But I always felt that that was a, a big part of what I was looking for. And the way I learned to draw the Muppets was basically to go on the set while they were recording. I mean, right. setting that up, was that was the key. That was the thing that, that I think was a good thing to do. When I first met Jim Henson, I asked him if I could go to the set. I said, I, I really want to learn to do this right. And I, I would love to be able to explore the Muppets. And he encouraged me to go to the Muppet Morgue, for example, and play with the puppets when no one else was around. I had them all to myself, like a little kid with his toys, with his yeah. puppets. And I would take, I took a few photographs and I'd do some sketches and, and I would just see how they moved and I played around with them. And when I went to the studio to watch them record the show, obviously there was 
movement everywhere. You know, they were running around. And they, these were tall guys. And so they, they had like everything was up in the air, like the like Ernie and Bert's room is way the heck up in the air. Yeah, like four or five feet off the ground so that they could be standing while they while they puppeteer. They're standing, their arm is over their heads, and they're running around. And of course, they're not, they're below the, the screen. But it was that movement that I wanted to capture. And I noticed that if I drew and painted too much, if I overpainted and overdrew, the action would come to a screeching halt and it would be mm. dead. And I had to learn to draw faster and to paint faster. And I didn't want to get too hung up painting every little piece of fur, basically. Right. So I think some of the artists were really wonderful. They were like Norman Rockwell. But I thought the, the characters were frozen and, and stilted. And I was trying to paint fewer and have not every piece of fur showing so that they could be in movement. Yeah. Does that make any sense to you? It absolutely does. And I think a wonderful example of this, if you look at some of the first drawings of Big Bird that you did in the early 70s and compare it to by by the time the 1980s or 90s rolled around, you kind of stopped drawing every feather. It kind of just became a mass and you would, in, in strategic places, add a couple little notches and such to, to suggest feather, but it was more in the painting and, and just in the, the true outline of the contours, you kind of get to assume, you know, you in your own mind's eye, you get to, to say, oh yeah, that's, those are all the 4,000 feathers that are on him. Right, right. So, sort of Monet paints the Muppets or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you... I like that. The Monet of the Muppets. Did you also, because when you started, I'm just thinking, I, I've read that there really wasn't a character style guide yet. That's right. And, um, you know, certain characters, of course, Big Bird and, you know, a, a few others had, you know, legs that we had known about, but certainly a, a cookie monster, or I'm trying to think of some other characters who... We didn't know what they looked like below the waist. Did you have any input in saying like, oh, this is what Cookie Monster's feet would look like? At the beginning, yes. Uh, it was kind of up to the illustrator to, to draw them what he thought. And back then, Jim Henson was the one who actually looked at each drawing and approved it and made blue line corrections and that sort of thing. Right. You can just imagine Jim Henson was the only one that could do that. And I think after him... The only one was uh, Michael Frith when he sure. left Random House and went to Muppets. And he was the I mean, he was such a great influence on me. He was the one that first hired me at Random House. And I liked the way he drew the Muppets. They were full of action with him, too. But he yeah. wasn't really an illustrator most of the time. He was an art director. But he could have been a, a great illustrator. But oh, he, sure. he took that art director path, which suited his personality and temperament and everything. And I, I remember drawing... Harry Monster. For some reason, we drew him with pants on. Yeah, striped, striped red pants. <laughs> That's right. And, yeah. and like Cookie Monster, we had buck, buck naked and Grover was <laughs> naked. And all these guys. Were, but Harry, for some reason, they felt they, they got all that pants on him. He probably looked more masculine than the others or something. Right, right. We got to put some pants on this guy. I, I don't even know how that came about. but Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. No, it, and you know, that I'm pretty sure still holds true there there was an action figure that got made one of those funko pop things recently and he, he still had him there <laughs> and eventually the muppet people all you know built legs like or they weren't sure. really used or anything i don't most of the time but yeah but somehow that all got worked out i'm not sure how that how that happened but but there were no style books and that's why i felt that that i should go to the muppet morgue and go to the all the tapings and that sort of thing and I think that really worked out very well. And, and don't forget, there were no VCRs back then. So you couldn't record yes. the show and you couldn't like freeze frame anything because if you did pause something, they did have pause buttons, but the image- But they weren't very, yeah, it, was, it would be all jarbled. It's not like today. Yeah, you couldn't make anything out. So you, you had to draw everything on the fly. So you'd see Grover, is it by and you try to draw that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your best chance probably was in the morgue just to be like, oh, okay, so this is what, that's how many fingers he has. That's so, that's so wild. And can you describe a little bit of just what it was like to be on the Muppet team back then? Because it was such a, you know, Jim famously always referred to it as, as a family atmosphere, everyone who worked mm -hmm. there. But can you just kind of talk about 
what it was like. I mean, it, it seems like you were so warmly welcomed to just have carte blanche of coming to the set or, or being in the morgue. But what kind of was that atmosphere? What was it like to be, to be one of those Muppet people, one of the Muppet guys? Gee, it was, it was such a welcoming place. Everyone would say hello if I showed up and I, I wanted to stay out of their way. And this is a television studio. Right. There's a lot of equipment and cameras and cables and prop people and the whole street and the Ernie and Bert's place, whatever they're doing that day. You know, I, I really didn't want to get in their way, but I'm sure I was in their way plenty until I found the, the right spot for the day. Nobody was ever made me feel like I was, I shouldn't, I didn't belong there. Or I even took my kids in a couple of times. Oh, nice. Which was, and they, they would st- drop everything to come and bring the characters down. Ernie, this is Jim Henson himself yeah. and Frank Oz. They come down and the Carol Spinney would, would do it. You know, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. Richie Hunt giving a tour of the place and yeah. So they made it so much fun. You know, there's so many younger people around like you and uh, others that I've heard talk on your interviews and everything and they capture, they, they understand what it was like back then, but this is going way back, you know, mm-hmm. but it was the further you go back, the more accessible they all were, I think, you know. Yeah, I mean, they were just less busy. You know, once the Muppet Show started, Jim and a lot of the people spent a lot of their time in England. Mm-hmm. So when they got back, they were really under the, everyone wanted a piece of them. Yeah. I have to tell you a great story to give you a, a sense of the, the set. Please, please. One day I, I went, I was going to spend the afternoon at the set watching them tape. And uh, I got there late that day. And when I got there, apparently they had broken for lunch. So I walked in, and at that point, I had made myself so visible that the guard at the door didn't question who I was. He just recognized me and said, hello, and I went in. Yeah. So I went in, and there's Sesame Street. There's the set, but there's no one there. Everyone's gone to lunch. There's not a cameraman. There's no one no one hanging around. And I'm just walking around. I can hear my own feet echoing on, on the set, and I'm walking around, and I just said, this is – isn't this beautiful? I am all alone on Sesame Street. And I walked past Hooper's store and I walked past the Brownstone and I was on my way toward Big Bird's Nest and I walked past Oscar's trash can. And when I got just up to Oscar's trash can, the lid flew open with a <laughs> bang and you know, <laughs> scared the dickens out of me. And out of the can popped Oscar the Grouch. And he said, Joe Matthew, what are you doing here? <laughs> and, and he said, and I used to, I came from a town called Putnam, Connecticut. Okay. And, said, and how are things in yucky Putnam, Connecticut? And of course, when I came down from the ceiling, there was Carol Spinney. You know, it comes out from underneath Oscar and he says, Hello, and how you doing, and all that sort of thing. Well, he gave mm-hmm. me a coronary. But, you know, he was down there when everyone was at lunch. He was in the can down there with Oscar, studying his lines or something like that. Yeah. And, of course, he had a monitor. And he saw right. me on his monitor come in mm-hmm. and walk through. And he just thought, I'll give Joe a little surprise. You were, yeah, you were a fish in a barrel there. <laughs> <laughs> I know animators to be sort of a a cliche with them is that they really feel like they're acting with their pencils, right? And especially now 3D animators, you know, will even say that the the models that they're manipulating, they feel like puppeteers, you know, they're, they're really putting that performance as they, as they create that life on the, on the screen. Do you have a similar feeling as you, you know, draw, draw the characters that, you put into into the books or on the covers of albums or anything like that? Or is it a different kind of relationship? No, that's, that's a good description of it, really. I mean, I can't draw an explosion unless I'm making the sound. <laughs> no, yeah. zoom, zock, zoom, you know, you make all the sound effects when you're doing it. And I, and I think that moves your hand. You have to see the thing before you draw it. Mm-hmm. So you have to see the explosion. And if you can hear it, 
you try to make it happen in front of you, you know. And I always say that the book is is pretty much illustrated when you've done thumbnails or rough sketches. That's where all the work is done. Right. That's where all the sound effects are done in, in your fantasy of the whole thing working. Then you do a finished version version with paint and everything. And the, the thing is, you don't want to lose the freshness. Yes. And, and the movement. That's that's where it's hard to keep it going. You know. That is that is so true, and I I think that's something that I would imagine a lot of artists feel that you do your blue lines or you do whatever kind of rough sketch and then you go in and, and ink it or you add color to it and all of a sudden it's like, well, what happened? This just right. got sterilized. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's not fun anymore. Well, when the when the blue liners ask you to do things over again, that's, I, you know, I completely understand. As much as I hate blue liners, you know, I hate it when they change, when you, because I did it the way I thought looked right. And then someone says, no, that's not right. Yeah. But I have to admit that usually when I've done the blue line, after I've done it, I say reluctantly, he was right. They were right. <laughs> she was right. They were right. Yep. It's better now. But I don't know how many times they think I can draw this. If they want me to draw something four times, it's not going to be fresh the fourth time around. You know? Yeah. You know, the other thing is when Jim Henson started this whole thing, he did not really encourage people to draw every, every, everything the same. It was not Disney Studio. Right. He really encouraged individual stylings. He wanted them to look different. I mean, there were certain things that he was very particular about. The shape of Ernie's mouth or Big Bird's beak or whatever it was had to have the right feeling. But mm -hmm. you could accomplish that whatever way worked for you. And I think, I think now it's, it's much more like this codified notion of almost like a Disney Studio where you have to draw everything exactly. Everyone's supposed to draw them the same way. Yeah. You know, I don't like that as much, but I can see where that's practical. Yeah, there's, I, I suppose there's a place for it and it's the way the industry moves. But yeah, as, as a kid growing up and being able to pick up one book from the next to the other and see three different depictions of those characters, it's not like anyone ever... I think would pick those books up and say, who's this new character? <laughs> it was just, oh, this is, kids are smart enough to know like, oh, this is just a different interpretation of the people who I love from the TV right. show. And back then, you know, I used to ask Jim about this character or that character. Should, should it be this or should it be that? And when he looked at it, he'd say, well, you know, why don't you do it this way? He would never like tell you to do something. It was, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe you could do something. He suggested, but right. for example... A character like Grover or Bert, they have these heads that are basically sawed in half so that the mouth will open. You know, yeah. I think the first Grover was made from a plastic bowling ball. And so they took a knife and they must have cut that bowling ball almost in two pieces so that the mouth would hinge. Mm -hmm. They had to create a hinge. Yep. And as a result, their smile, if you looked full face, full on, their mouth would go disappear around the sides of their head. And Jim's Jim thought that looked terrible. He said, because this is the way we have to build them so that the mouths work. But he said, when you draw them, don't don't make the mouth go all the way to the going off the sides of the head. That looks ridiculous. Because the, to me, the, the character existed in his imagination. He was God yep. in this case. He created them. So whatever he said was the way it should be. And so now the blue line is, they didn't know Jim probably. You know, I don't know who, who blue lines these things today, but they pr probably didn't know Jim and he probably never said, don't do that. So they always have us draw the mouths going oh, right off the, the side. Yeah. This, that's the way I draw them now. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the, the way we drew them back then, probably people look at my old drawings and say, my God, he didn't know how to draw the characters at all. <laughs> look how skinny Big Bird is and, you know, this, uh, this and that and the other thing. But I think, first of all, I was reflecting Jim's concept of the character not so yeah. much the Muppet Builders version of his mm -hmm. creation but also the characters did evolve oh if you sure look at early early pictures of Big Bird he was real skinny and scrawny and that sort of thing so you know they got fatter and cuter over the years mm -hmm. furrier and featherier <laughs> yes <laughs> when I look at the Sesame Street dictionary and that's still ah, uh, that's still in print, sure. which is amazing to me. But the characters all look kind of old-fashioned, 
But then again, if you if you notice, there's no word for computer. There's no computer. The word computer is not in the dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> and a telephone is this big old landline thing, you know? Right, right, right. So it's a very old fashioned book, really. Yeah, no, that's so true. Uh, I wonder, too, at a certain point, there's only so many different ways that you can draw any one of these characters with, within an era, of course, whether it's in a, in a book or on a piece of merchandise or anything like that. Was there ever pressure from folks who are just trying to get product moving and, and things through the pipeline to you know either trace or just copy illustrations from different projects? I think some illustrators did that. That was their own, their own doing. You know, I think yeah. the challenge of, of drawing these characters over and over and over again. My goal was to get better at it, so sure. I would never reuse. Oh, gee, I got that. I did such a good Ernie or Big Bird here. I, I'm just going to trace that one. If you start doing that, you'll never get any better. Right. And I think some illustrators did. I could kind of tell by looking at it. You can, you can tell. It didn't quite belong. That head didn't belong on that body somehow. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, oh, I, I think that person is cheating a little bit there. <laughs> but I tried not to do that because, frankly, it didn't work. Yeah. And you got better the more you drew them. You know, that was really the way to, to improve. Right. At a certain point, were you referencing your own images from time to time? Or did you just know them so well that you would create them? Or did you have any sort of... I don't know, either maquettes or just images or, or anything, or were you really just coming up with it out of your own mind and imagination? I, I had them in my head. Yeah. And I used to watch the show a lot. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I talk about going into the studio and watching them and all that sort of thing, but right. I watched, watched them on TV a heck of a lot. Also, mm -hmm. I think when I first started, I had pictures of them, you know, whatever pictures existed, which weren't many, no. I would have around. But they changed so much. I mean, they, they would being rebuilt all the time, and they would change from from version to version. I mean, I, I think sometimes the ones that I see now, sometimes I even wonder, you know, the, yeah. is that right? That is, is that Ernie? Right. It, because they have evolved, and it, they're mm -hmm. made of different materials now, and you know, all that has evolved. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing is, back then, doing product work, I did a lot of product work. Which sure. I, and I never enjoyed as much as the books. I thought the books were the real, that was the real thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And the books, were just the toys, I thought, yeah, they'll be around for a little while and they'll disappear. But th they paid very well. You could do a, a couple of little drawings and, and make a lot of money. You'd make as much as you would for an entire book. Yeah. And you got paid for each and every one you did. So if they needed for their packaging three or four versions of a character, and they were all slightly different sizes. You drew them, all the different versions at the different sizes. And what they do nowadays, of course, is it's done with vector right. graphics. <laughs> so they only have to do one. Yeah. And then they move the arms and legs around and change the sizes and all that sort of thing. So there's no more, there's no money for that. They, they don't even hire illustrators to do Yeah, product. no, well, and that's kind of where I was getting at with that question about reusing you know, those assets in a way, because I, I would, mm -hmm. could only imagine now that they do just have those vector models that they're able to bend and move and, and pose them however they want, however they need. And I think that that's influenced the way they want us to draw them, too, because they've got yeah. these thousands of vector images now in their library. They don't have to hire an illustrator. So the books now have to match their vector art, I think. Mm -hmm. But that, that's just um, that's life, I guess, you know. Right. The the move to digital, I know you've said you kind of at a at a time were really hoping that, you know, you didn't have to make that transition. Now it seems like you've certainly embraced it and, you know, are in that world and creating art in that way. What do you think we lose and what do you think we gain in that move to to digital? Boy, um Well, there's a certain look you lose. Uh you know, people people like the the originals. Uh, one thing is you don't have originals. You don't have original art any longer. Yeah. And I, I've got a lot of original art. You know, it does have a certain look. It's it's very nice. I sell some of it on my through my website, mm -hmm. and it's nice to have that. But I wouldn't have room for any more. I'm glad I don't have to store <laughs> yeah. any more than I already have. It just takes up space. 
But there is a certain look that's nice about those old books and those those watercolor backgrounds and that sort of thing. I I have to admit I, I miss that a little bit. What have we gained? I don't know. Uh, I suppose you can get brighter colors. There are certain things you can do. You can you don't have to worry about washes in the backgrounds. You can lay down these beautiful gradients and all this sort of thing, which kids don't care about. I I don't know, but I, I think people like the old stuff better yeah. in a way. But I, I, you can't go back to that. Right. Nobody, nobody would hire me or anyone else who worked that way, I don't think. First of all, sheer practical terms. Oh, yeah. I mean, the time the, you save. The art directors of today have never received a big brown cardboard package from an old illustrator in New England and had to unwrap it and then realize they need a change. Now they have to <laughs> rewrap it and send it back. They, they want to send you an email and just say, fix it in five mm -hmm. minutes. And you can fix it in five minutes and upload it again. You know, it's it's really practical matters. As much as I used to love wrapping, I, well, I used to have big layout tables. And I'd lay out the whole book. And when the book was finished, I'd have a couple of friends come over. We'd have wine. But they couldn't take the wine in the studio. I didn't oh, want sure. them spilling it. No, of so, course not. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd look at the book, and that was a lot of fun. And then I'd wrap the whole book up, and I'd put on a nice jacket and tie and go into New York City and they have a big table in an office in a, in a conference room and I'd lay the whole book out and everyone would cheer and we'd go out and have a nice big French meal and all that sort of thing. Well, I miss that, yeah. but um, I don't miss having to wrap the thing up and take the train into New York and drag this package around. So there, there are pluses and minuses to everything. They do. I mean, it does reproduce nicely. The, the Photoshop and whatever else, the digital graphics do reproduce nicely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't have to get your face down really close to, to draw something small. True. You know, you can just <laughs> enlarge it on the screen. Pinch, it's pinch it back. bigger. Yep. Yeah, right. It, it's, um, it, it's a lot easier this way. They're both nice, but I like the old look, but it's just not practical any longer. Doesn't make any sense. So I, I have a friend, and he, when I started working this way, he said, "Well, that isn't natural. That's not right. It's not natural." Well, I said, "Well, I don't know what what you mean by that, because even if I draw this on what you think is natural on paper with watercolor, and I give it to the publisher, they're going to send it to the printer, and the printer is going to scan it, and it's going to be a digital image anyway." <laughs> <laughs> right. No, and uh, you know, and it's funny, I've had conversations with film directors who say a similar kind of thing about the difference between shooting digitally or shooting with, with actual film. They said, because once, once you get that film developed, it instantly gets digitized and put into a computer <laughs> so that the editor can it, uh, edit it digitally and, and all those things. So it's at a certain point, yeah, it's like, why not just do the whole thing, do it all digitally? Well, and you know that back in the 70s and 80s, when you did a rough sketch, this was the art director's opportunity to make changes. Right. And once you once they gave it back to you and you did the finish, unless you did something really stupid, they were going to take it. And if you had to make a change back then, you got really good at with razor blades and scotch tape and yeah. that sort of thing. <laughs> but F physically cutting and pasting, right? <laughs> physically, yeah that's, right. yeah, that's right. You had to be a surgeon. And, yeah. uh, but today, you know, they know you can change things after the fact. So they're sort of like, they'll, they're sort of make the changes at the rough sketch stage, but you know, you're going to get more of many more of them on the finished art. Mm -hmm. And they'll just send an email and say, we want Elmo to be 10% smaller. Well, that's very easily said and, and it's very easily done today, but yep. that would be a real headache <laughs> in 1980. <laughs> and nowadays they, they say we want Elmo 10% smaller uh, and the, the book is going to print tomorrow, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> <sighs> oh, that's great. You know, you mentioned kind of the layout of encouraging the art to move from left to right and those types of considerations as you're, as you're illustrating a book. What other things are you keeping in mind as the illustrator in terms of the experience of just reading the physical book, either things that you're putting in or I, I just think about like if an illustrator is too good at his job, 
you don't need the words of the book, right? <laughs> so like what kind of balance do you have to do to properly complement the whole experience of of the reading? Well, you know, I think the nature of the books has changed. When you say that, I did actually illustrate a number of books with no manuscript. Mm -hmm. and that like was, uh, Big Bird's Big Book, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that was That's a, the perfect example. I could think of several others, too, and for very good reason. And they put a little verbiage in later. Yeah. But you really didn't need the words. Gee, there was one with transparent pages and all sorts of cut out things. And you could see all the way through oh, the book. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there were flip books where things would open and things would pop, kind of like pop-ups and doors mm -hmm. and windows. And when I got really good at that, I, they, the window would open through several pages. So you had to keep this going for several spreads. And that was very difficult. But I loved it. It was such a challenge. And they were good books. And they, they, they were fairly popular, too. So I got, to, I got to do this over and over again. But I think in the early days of Sesame Street, the targeted audience was preschool to something like second grade. And there were older kids than that actually using them. And there were kids, say, in Japan, there were teenagers who were learning to read English yep. from these books. Sesame Street was very popular in Japan with teenagers. So you had this vast range of ages. And so there were some of the books were a little like something you'd give a, a little baby in a, in a, yeah. Um, playpen, a playpen. Thank you. Yeah. And then there were other books that were stories and got into emotions and personal feelings and all these things. And, you know, conscience and Ernie's, Ernie's little lie. And, you know, he had to grapple with having told a lie. Yeah. I knew we'd get around to the lie sooner or later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or even, you know, you did, uh, I'm thinking about the Mr. Hooper. Yes. The goodbye to Mr. Hooper yes. books that you did. The, well, that's right. In terms of adult themes. And, yes. And yeah. Older, advanced themes, more difficult themes. And so, you know, there there's no room for in, for that sort of book anymore. There, those yeah. are for much older kids. So it's different. I mean, those it really took an illustrator to illustrate that type of a book. But today it's kind of like just decorating in a sense. You know, we, we want Elmo dancing on this page and then dancing on this page and then throwing a ball on that page. And it's, it's not so much an illustration assignment. It's almost a toy, basically. But that's just the way the, the market dictates that, you know. Mm -hmm. There's not room on the shelves no, what an intriguing distinction. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. You know, they had all these this range of ages and everything, but there were also, there was a lot of room in the stores to carry all these Sesame Street books and products and everything. You know, there were only two or three licenses that, that they had to deal with. And now they've got hundreds of licenses and yeah. all types of characters. And there's just no room for all this. So Sesame Street has had to narrow its audience quite mm -hmm. dramatically. But, you know, at, at this point, I'm glad I got to do both. But at this, at this point, I'm just happy to have some, some work to do. And you know, yeah. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. You can't, can't turn back the clock in, anyway. Right, right. Yeah, I also wanted to talk briefly about the work that you did for album covers, yeah. which were so great. And I wonder, I, I feel like as a, as a designer, that's kind of like the same way that everyone wants to be a rock star if they're any kind of musician, that anyone who who's in the, the visual arts kind of want to be able to to design an album cover. There's just something so cool yeah, about it. But true. what what would be your process in trying to marry the sound of whatever the music was on the album and convey that so that the person could judge the book by its cover, so to speak? Gee, that's... Um... That's an interesting uh, question because, uh, you know, first of all, remember that we had LPs. Of course, they're, they're, I, I know they're, they're coming back, but uh, that was 12 and three quarters or 12 and five eighths or something square was the was the stage that we were dealing with, yeah. which was a lot nicer than a CD cover. Oh, sure. But I don't know. I just like the music, basically. I, I got into old, old jazz, like the 1920s and that's Jelly Roll Morton and all this sort of thing. 
that, that's like when I took up cycling at, at around that time, I started going out to, to hear music and, uh, and you could hear that type of music back then, which I really loved. I mean, I grew up with rock and roll and everything. And when I was in art school, RISD was the place everyone wanted to play. So we got to hear everybody. We heard Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, everybody, everybody came wow. to RISD. So that was a lot of fun. And after I got out of, out of RISD, I got kind of got sick of the music and, and I discovered this old jazz and stride piano and all this stuff. And I just thought, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. So it was just my own enthusiasm. I had a ball doing that. I did some 60 something uh, album covers, I think, uh, at that time. And that was just a lot of fun. And I liked doing caricatures and that gave me an opportunity to, to do some caricatures. And, and as far as experimenting as an illustrator with technique and this sort of thing, an album cover was one shot. You know, you could mess around with with a technique, a new look, a new technique or something. Whereas if you tried to do that with a book, you got 32 pages. You have to <laughs> yes. maintain it for a heck of a long time. And if you don't like it, you're stuck with it for a long time. Right. But the album covers were a great place to practice, basically. And they were great fun. And as the musicians would tell me, they'd say they'd play all these festivals and different gigs that, where they would have their, their various albums for sale. You know, during the break, we'll be selling our, our latest album up here. And people would come down and they'd look at all the albums. Well, they don't have time to audition all the albums. Right. So what they do is they pretty much buy a book by its cover. They would pick out their favorite artwork and buy, buy the album. And the, the bands would tell me, you know, you're helping us sell an awful lot of records but they won't buy any of the other record uh, LPs. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you say reissue the album. I'll do a new one. <laughs> I wonder, is there a pestering or sort of most frequent question that people have about you and your work that you'd like to be able to answer here once and for all? <laughs> Jack, I can't think of anything. Uh, it, it's great to have a website because people can find me. And uh, I do get uh -huh. mail, and that's a very nice thing. I get to hear from people. Gee, I just heard this morning, I heard from a fellow I went to prep school with. It's the first time I've ever heard from him, you know? Oh, my goodness. If someone wants to take the trouble, they can find you. But I think it's just wonderful that people start thinking about who, who drew this, who illustrated this, and, and they take their computer and they actually look you up and send you a, an email. I think that's fantastic, especially when it's um, a multi-generational thing. Like we had this book. I had it when I was a kid. Now I'm giving it to my children or grandchildren. Right. It's right. phenomenal. It's wonderful. Basically, the, the big question, the one I hear the most is, how come this book's out of print? Oh, <laughs> Books go out of print. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, right to the publisher. Right, right, right. Find it on eBay. What's something about your job that people take for granted and think that it's easy, but in reality, it's actually quite difficult? Well, I can sort of turn that on its head a little bit. People will say, you've worked for yourself. You've been self-employed for over 50 years. You're just there alone in, in your studio or by yourself all day long. That's crazy. They said, I could never do that, first of all. And secondly, I would never get anything done. I would just sit around watching TV all day. <laughs> the only thing I can say is, no, you wouldn't. First of all, if you'd risked your entire life to do this and you think that you're a fraud and you think that it could all disappear tomorrow, you work under a state of terror that you might it might all dry up and go away just as quickly as it arrived in the first place. And secondly, I do it because I like doing it. So it's yeah. not really work. So if you can make your play your work, you never work a day in your life. You know, people have funny misconceptions about what it's like to work alone. Although the working alone part, I guess, is a different thing. I, guess, I don't mind being alone. I, I'm not even aware of it. I'm, I'm, I'm only aware of the work. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think of that, but I, I think I would probably be a horrible employee anyway. <laughs> I think I would, be, I would try to be getting away with trying not to do my work. I'd be, I'd be very clever at hiding that I, the fact that I'm doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I'm alone in a room, I can't fake anybody out. There's no one to fool. Mm -hmm. If I'm not working, no one's working. Right. 
I was going to say, and when you're the boss, yeah, you got to hold yourself accountable. And I suppose in a way, too, you're not to be too woo about it, but you're not quite alone because you're with the, the characters who are there, there with you on the page. I don't feel alone. That's right. Yeah. I don't feel alone at all. But it, but that's how I got into going out to hear jazz. I would I, mm. I would be alone and I'd say, wow, I just finished that project. I've got to get the heck out of this room. Yeah. And I'd go out and see people that I, I knew in that world. And um, my wife would come home from work and say, well, you go up because... I've been seeing people all day. I've been talking to people all day. I don't want to talk to another person. So you go out and talk to people and I'll stay home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good balance. What do you hope that the legacy of your work will be? I don't know. Um, gee, it's a, it's a funny thought, but I, I get to enjoy a little of, of it when I get when I get fan mail, when I get... When people look me up and they say, you know, we love this and that. I mean, they, they say things that I never would have thought of. Th things mean something to them. And sometimes I wasn't even aware that I put that in there. Yeah. You know, they, they get lessons out of it. They, they're inspired by the, by the books. It's, it's quite amazing, really. I wouldn't know that if I didn't have a website and mm -hmm. get emails. You know, they, they don't come by. They don't drop by the house. But that's, it's a nice thing to get feedback. I just love the people that the illustrators that influenced me and i guess just being part of that that world is uh is really amazing to me i guess you know i've done enough work that they can't get rid of me now they <laughs> it's, it's there i did it but um i can't express i can't articulate that no that's that's really lovely and yet it becomes there there's that lineage of you you feel like you're not only that you come from the people who inspired you and you you feel like you stood on their shoulders but there's now you know certainly a whole a whole crop of illustrators and people who saw your work as as they were growing up and feel like you're propping them up now that's that's unbelievable to me that's incredible mm -hmm. yeah and i i think um the era that i came up in when you would get the audio books on the books on tape of anything that you'd read along to just being able to hear the author and illustrator's name said aloud was yes. a, a wonderful way to just be like, Oh, okay. I keep, I keep recognizing it was almost as if to a certain point, at least for me, I was someone who really so loved different, different books and, and especially the illustrators, but it was almost as if you were one of the characters in those those books growing up it was like oh good this is a joe matthew book yeah i've yeah. <laughs> heard that before actually sometimes uh, joe matthew will be the first word <laughs> some some kid says because in the early early days they would allow a signature right uh, and, and later on they, they they wouldn't have any of that yeah but on some of the old books it would say joe matthew on the on the end pages or wherever mm -hmm. and the kids the kid says to his grandfather who's reading them the book what's that What's that signature that, you know, he doesn't know what that is. Yeah. Oh, the, the grandfather would say, well, that's Joe Matthew. Oh, and so the next time they take the book out, they say, hey, look, there's Joe Matthew. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. Well, how can people learn more about you and, and all the work that you do? Well, I guess my website has, yeah. has a lot of stuff on it. That's, that's a good place to go. No, that's perfect. And there are are also I'll I'll direct people in in the show notes, but some wonderful other past interviews that you've done, conversations like this and and others and wonderful way to see 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 the work. But uh Joe, one one last thing I always want to express my gratitude to the people who come on. I just want to say that you created work and illustrations that made my life richer and into the artist that I wanted to be. I think your drawings have made generations of children into the people that they are today. And uh, please keep lighting up our imaginations. That's really nice, Cam. appreciate it very much. Absolutely. It, it amazes me to look at your work and some of the people that you've interviewed. And I, I tried to listen to a few interviews this week and I'm, I'm so impressed. I'm almost, uh, intimidated to come on your show oh no <laughs> it's so great that there's so many talented people and I, I hope you'll uh hope you'll keep in touch 
I I certainly will, and I've got your number now, so you're all, I'll, right. I'll try Mr. not to bother you too much. <laughs> Mr. Techie over here. <laughs> yeah. We got it to work. Yes, wonderful. Thanks again, Joe. Thanks so much, Kim. Take care. We did it. You came to the end of another episode of This Should Have Been a Phone Call. So much thanks to Joe for joining us. Like I said before, it was just beyond a dream come true. If this is your first time listening, there are plenty of other episodes of the show. Just go to phonecallpod.com and you can listen to all of them right now. Please give us a follow at phonecallpod wherever you get your social media. And if you're feeling brave, I always, always, always appreciate a good review or comment over at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps the show grow, but it also wins you both showcase showdowns. So I definitely appreciate that. We'll see you next time on This Should Have Been a Phone Call. Oh, and one more thing. I love you. You're enough. Keep going. Keep going.